Hello, welcome to the Monday, July 29th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Boston, Massachusetts. On Friday, Kevin observed a significant uptick in scans for port 34567. That's uh, 34,000. 567. This port uh, appears to be associated with network cameras and I look at a couple of the IPs that are scanning for this port. It looks like they're also scanning port 9527, 9527, which is another IP webcam associated port. The second one actually has a specific vulnerability associated with it. CVE 2017-11633. That vulnerability, it's an information leakage vulnerability, and apparently it can be used to retrieve usernames and passwords. So in general, this looks like sort of yet another variant of some botnet. I don't want to call it Mirai because we don't have any uh, code yet, uh, but there are so many of these Mirai nutter variants going around looking for vulnerable uh, cameras. In this case, they appear to be looking for sort of for what I call secondary vulnerabilities. Not the big ones like usernames and passwords and such, but maybe vulnerabilities that other bots missed. Given how hard these cameras have been hit, there are probably only very few cameras left with default passwords, if any, that have not already been infected. And if you are using LibreOffice, the free and open source office suite, well, uh, be aware with documents and macros. Now, for Microsoft Office users, macros have long been recognized as evil and users are by default asked for permission before any macro is executed. Now, LibreOffice macros are a little bit different in the sense that they can be pre-installed uh, with LibreOffice. You can add your own macros to LibreOffice and then documents can use them. But uh, there are issues with some macros allowing arbitrary code execution, if not intentionally, so uh, well uh, by mistake. So for example, by default, LibreOffice ships with a simple macro that's really most of a sample macro that allows users to create documents that are drawing images using a logo style turtle as a cursor. Apparently, uh, this macro is then called Libre Logo, and uh, essentially what it does is it takes this graphing code that's being sent to it and translates it to Python to do the actual drawing. The problem is that if you send Python to the macro, it actually doesn't translate it and it just executes it as Python because, well, uh, the entire translation feature is a little bit buggy the way it's implemented. So an attacker may include a Libra logo script in a document to execute Python code as a user that opens a document. And in LibreOffice, you will not get a warning in this case. Remember, those macros are sort of pre-installed. The macro is not part of the document. It's just a function that calls the macro that's part of the document. So with Python code, of course, you have full access to the system and any user opening a document with a malicious uh, macro is subject to exploitation here. Creating an exploit is trivial and a proof of concept exploit is included in the blog post that describes this vulnerability. The vulnerability has been patched on July 1st. So the person that found the vulnerability actually gave it some time uh, before publishing all the details. Of course, the ultimate problem still exists that vulnerable macros may expose the user to similar exploits in the future. The Leaper logo macro is still included, but now in a fixed version that hopefully no longer allows for this code execution. Now, one recommendation, of course, is to install, to uninstall all macros, including this uh, Leaper logo macro from LibreOffice. 
With the Zoom video conferencing vulnerability last week, uh, local web servers uh, being used to launch executables have become a new focus sort of, of security researchers. One other web server like this is included in Amazon's music program. Now, uh, while at least it does not appear to be suffer from the same sort of simple operating code execution that Zoom had, it has some other, a little bit more tricky issue. The application actually uses a host name to connect to the web server, and that host name happens to resolve to localhost. Uh, so it does not use just uh, the 127.0.0.1 or colon colon one address uh, to connect to the web server. In addition, it uses HTTPS versus HTTP. Of course, once you have a host name, yes, then you can use HTTPS. Uh, however, of course, you know, that doesn't really gain you much when you're uh, dealing uh, with localhost. And the web server uh, that is uh, included here does have a certificate for amazonmusiclocal.com. And of course, to use the certificate, the web server also includes a secret key. Security researcher uh, Kern Rohorst uh, published a blog post illustrating how he was able uh, to extract the secret key from the application. Now, the secret key was encrypted, but of course, that doesn't do much good if the password is included in the application as well. And using a disassembler, it was not all that terribly difficult to retrieve that passphrase and ultimately get access to the secret key. Now, Amazon actually issues that certificate themselves. Uh, Amazon has a trusted certificate authority, but they were very quick in revoking this particular certificate. Uh, the certificate was revoked even before the private key was published. As soon as a word about the certificate showed up on Twitter, Amazon already went ahead and revoked the certificate. Well, uh, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.